guys, happy Friday. I hope your week is going well. Today is the Q&A where I address a topic that you guys ask me a lot of questions about. Last week I talked about dry brushing and you guys really seem to enjoy that. I answered your questions about dry brushing and kind of in continuation of the theme of spa related Q&As, today I'm gonna to do a Q&A all about saunas and my thoughts on them. You guys asked me a fair amount are infrared saunas good for the skin? How about traditional finish saunas or um, steam saunas? So the practice of going into a sauna for relaxation purposes, potential health benefits, that is something that has been pursued by people all over the world for many, many, many years. It is a long-standing cultural tradition in areas like Finland, um, in Turkey, there are Turkish bathhouses. So this is something that people all over the world are interested in. In the most basic sense, a sauna is a form of whole body thermotherapy or heating the body. The source of that heat is going to vary with a different type of sauna. Traditional Finnish saunas involve short exposures to dry heat, usually in the temperature range of anywhere from 80 degrees to 108 degrees Celsius, um, and it's dry heat. However, that is also intermittently interspersed with bursts of steam by the practice of taking water and scattering it over heated dry rocks. There are also saunas that are steam heat that are very common in a lot of spas. Gyms will have steam saunas, a steam room. Infrared uh, relies on infrared radiation to heat to heat the body. Infrared radiation allows for heating, heating a heating source at a lower temperature, so in the range of 45 to 60 degrees Celsius. But the emission of infrared uh, allows for heating of, the, heating of the body without water, without dry heat, and a much lower temperature of 45 to 60 degrees. So saunas claim all sorts of purported health benefits from detoxification through the act of sweating, increased circulation, they claim improved cardiovascular outcomes, um, they also claim that doing a sauna can increase your metabolism, help with weight loss, uh, and they also um, <laughs> report improved immune function, improved sleep. By and large, whichever type of sauna you elect to pursue, I think we can all agree that most people pursue them and find benefit in, in using them, by and large, because they are relaxing, okay? Merely relaxing and self-care, I will just you know start off this video by emphasizing, have profound outcomes on your overall health, your overall well-being. Stress reduction and stress management help uh, in terms of our stress responses and uh, with time you know that that allows our immune system to function uh, more optimally we get sick less um, when we're under a lot of stress we are we are more we are more at risk for colds flus skin infections so anything that you pursue that you find relaxing um, is is going to likely benefit benefit you. I, I, that, I you know I say that tongue in cheek. There there are probably you know illicit drugs that would be relaxing that aren't beneficial. But by and large, you know these self care practices they do have major impact on our overall quality of life. So that's my positive commentary on on saunas and in seeking saunas and why I, I understand and appreciate that yeah they are nice and they are they are something relaxing to do and I definitely can see why why people who pursue them find them to be beneficial I definitely can relate to that um, but what is the evidence to support the claims so you'll find small studies out there that do show that for example Finnish saunas people who pursue a Finnish traditional Finnish sauna do have improved cardiovascular outcomes. Those studies are small and have certain limitations associated with them. If you look at large meta-analyses of all studies looking at the benefits of saunas, whether they be steam saunas, dry saunas, uh, infrared saunas, which pool together all of these smaller studies and kind of break, break them down and, and look at the overall evidence and, and critique it, Meta-analyses conclude that at this time, there's really insufficient evidence to go recommending sauna for any, any medical condition. Uh, so to say it's not going to be beneficial or couldn't be helpful, but not going to be something that is incorporated 
as a standard of care recommendation for things like cardiovascular disease, pulmonary health, um, and immune, and, and, you know, immune immunodeficiency conditions, etc. As far as potential benefit to the skin, you know. With, with exposure to a sauna, you have increased blood flow to the skin, and whenever you have a little bit of increased blood flow, you know, it, it can definitely make your skin appear more glowy, more radiant. It can help with uh, just kind of skin turnover, for sure. Um, it also can lead to some problems, which I'll address in a little bit. Um, but then this idea that increased sweat and just the act of sweating somehow is detoxifying the skin, I don't agree with that, and I think most dermatologists out there don't agree with that. Uh, sweat, it's true, sweat, eccrine sweat, uh, you, can, you can in fact excrete certain toxins uh, in eccrine sweat. However, that is not the primary function of, of production of eccrine sweat. Your liver is the organ, not your skin, that is tasked with the act of detoxification. Um, your liver has a very complicated enzyme network that helps to break down uh, potential toxins into things that you can then excrete in your urine, in, in feces. Um, sweat, is that is not the primary function of sweat. Things that, that are excreted in sweat include things like sodium, you know, salt by and large, which isn't toxic, you know, it's part of how our blood pressure is controlled. Um, and as far as toxins, things that can come out in the sweat are things like amphetamines, um, methadone, uh, morphine um, it can be excreted in the sweat. Certain environmental toxins like dioxins can be excreted in the sweat, but your, your liver, your kidney, those organ systems are primarily are what are what are responsible for breaking down these toxins and subsequent excretion of them out of the body. So that is that is how that is handled, not through sweat. Sweat functions to cool the body um, through evaporative water losses. In fact, people who have people who have suffer from diseases, um, just to illustrate this point, there are diseases out there where people do not produce eccrine sweat, okay? <clears throat> they do not sweat. And the danger and what, what hurts those people is that they get overheated. They don't die or, or have problems because they, because they became too toxic. They have problems because they may go out running or exercising or be in a hot environment and they can't cool the body like people with eccrine sweat glands. So hopefully that illustrates to you that really our sweat and sweat production have nothing to do with detoxifying, detoxifying the skin. That is, that, that is a separate organ, a separate organ system handles toxins. Over sweating in, in like a steam sauna, for example, the act of sweating for the skin is actually very, very irritating. Um, sweat, uh, pulls water actually out of our skin as we sweat. Um, you know, it's pulling water out and the skin becomes dry. When it becomes dry, it becomes hyper irritable. The skin barrier becomes impaired. Furthermore, sweat has some little compounds in it that are known as peritogens or itching, itching compounds. So sweat on the skin actually can, can be very itchy. Um, itch leads to scratching. Scratching behaviors further impair the skin barrier. People with atopic dermatitis, known commonly as eczema, they actually uh, you know, have to be very careful to make sure they rinse sweat off of their skin because sweat, um, because it is an irritant and because it has those itching, itching kind of compounds in it, really can kick off a flare of eczema for people with eczema. So sweat, sweating is you know, something that eczema sufferers really have to be conscientious of. But, and it's also a misconception that when you sweat or are produ producing sweat burns calories or helps you increase your metabolic rate or you know will help you lose weight. Maybe at, at a very, very low level, there may be some basal increased metabolic rate transiently, but your homeostatic mechanisms don't, don't subsequently keep your basal metabolic rate increased just by intermittently sweating like that. It's also a myth that sweating will um, clean out your pores, okay, um, and improve blackheads. Blackheads are not, the appearance of blackheads are not due to, are not due to toxins in the, in the pore, they're not due to dirt in the pore. 
blackheads, the, the black appearance is oxidized pigment uh, that results from air, exposure to air of, of that pigment from just accumulated skin cells. Sweating is not going to remove that. Um, sweating is not, is not going to facilitate removal of blackheads. Additionally, there was actually a small study that looked at just steam, steam sauna application to the face of people with acne. They counted the amount of, of acne lesions that the people in the study had before and then at the end. Um, at the end, people felt great, they were happy, they thought they looked better, but objectively, their acne was no better. And then subsequently, it has been shown that exposure to, to a steam sauna, and, ex, and as well as exposure to, to a dry sauna where you have increased sweat production, that sweat on the skin, because it's an irritant and impairs the skin barrier, actually can worsen acne down the road. So it's not recommended for people with, like I said, eczema or people with acne to go to go seeking a steam or dry sauna. And then the other thing that occurs with either steam saunas or dry saunas is that you do have uh, increased blood flow to the skin. That's, that's something that, that tempts people to use them in, in hoping that, that it might improve things. When you have increased blood flow to the skin and vasodilation, that can make persistent redness worse. So if you're someone with rosacea, seeking a infrared, seeking a steam sauna or a, a dry heat sauna, it's not recommended. Uh, it's gonna worsen the rosacea. But by and large, I think the biggest risk to the skin from these saunas is various types of skin infections. That's what we see the most um, clinically in dermatology as a result of people going into saunas, whether it be the steam sauna or the dry, the dry type of sauna. Um, people, uh, first of all, <laughs> the humidity and the warm climate is, is a breeding ground for, for tinea, tinea corporis, tinea pedis. That is the, that is a fancy name for athlete's foot and ringworm. Uh, so outbreaks of ringworm and um, athlete's foot, um, fungal infections on the skin, not uncommon in, in saunas and spas. No matter how hygienic the, these spas are, it's still a substantial risk. These dermatophytes, they make little spores that are incredibly hardy. And so, um, you know, it's really hard to, it's really hard to eliminate that, that risk particularly in an environment that's like a breeding ground for them. You also have people coming in and out of the sauna with bare feet uh, who, may, who may be coming into the sauna with a toenail fungus or a foot fungus. They're not uncommon to skin, to skin problems and they're bringing those spores in and leaving them behind and it, it becomes, it becomes a, a real risk with using the sauna. Bacterial infections are a major, major concern. Outbreaks of uh, staphylococcal skin infections in, in sauna, sauna users do occur. They are particularly problematic in high school athletes who may use a steam sauna after, after working out. Yeah, wrestlers are, are one population that really can be plagued with this problem. They, for example, you might, they might go to a, a, a tournament, a match, a meet, uh, and <laughs> because of the skin-on-skin -skin contact, they might acquire a staph infection from their from their opponent. And then <laughs> after after the meet, they go back into into the locker room. They take a steam sauna and they expose all of their teammates to to um, staph infection. And this can be a real real difficult problem um, amongst high school athletes, collegiate athletes. Um, we see it very commonly. It is, it is a risk of the steam saunas for sure. Then another adverse effect of infrared radiation exposure to the skin is a skin condition that is very disfiguring known as erythema abigni. Erythema abigni um, is the result of long-term exposure to heat below the threshold for what would generate a burn. Um, and that is seen and people, traditionally it was seen in people who didn't have central heating in their homes and would warm themselves by a fire and would stand in front of like a fireplace. And that radiant heat um, can actually have damaging effects on the skin. And this would, you know, show up on the lower legs in women. It also, you know, in, in subsequent decades started showing up on the lower back and people who would go to bed at night with a heating pack, still see cases of that. Now, in more modern times, we actually see cases of it 
from people who leave their laptop on their skin of their thighs, you know, you're working on your laptop for prolonged periods of time. That prolonged contact with, with heat, with a heat source, infrared heat source, below the threshold to cause a burn can cause this disfiguring skin condition known as erythema abigni. And what occurs and what happens when this occurs is the kind of the the veins in the in the skin, the blood flow in there, it sort of becomes stagnant and this results in transient kind of lace-like appearing redness and then that subsequently turns into hyperpigmentation. It's very disfiguring. It is virtually impossible to treat, to get rid of, and it also sets up a stage that affected skin is subsequently predisposed to developing skin cancers. So it is not a good thing to, it is not a good thing to have. Does that happen from infrared saunas? Probably not, okay? You probably go into the infrared sauna, you don't have skin on skin contact, and you're not, you're not in, in contact with that heat for a long enough time. But, however, the um, erythema abigni has been reported in people who use an infrared sauna belt. Apparently there's some kind of belt that you can put on that delivers infrared, infrared radiation and, and heats the body um, sub-threshold for a burn. But in those people, it has been reported that they developed this disfiguring permanent skin condition that can set them up for, for a risk of a skin cancer down the road. So that is, that's a risk, at least with the belt, most likely. Uh, so if, you, if you're interested in, in some kind of belt, I'm not really familiar with, with the belt, to be honest. I've just read reports of this developing. That is, that is a risk. So, so yeah, you know, now that I have Debbie Downard to death, the, the saunas, I don't, like I said, I don't underestimate the benefit of relaxing. It is, it is, it is really important, really important. So take home point, I would say if you were somebody with eczema, acne, rosacea, if you were someone who has a pre-existing medical condition that lowers your immune system, like diabetes, or you have an autoimmune disease that affects the function of your immune system, these, these medical conditions put you at risk for skin infections. I would say in those groups, be very, very, be wary of going into, into a sauna. The risks are more, more substantial to you. So the intent of this video is not to, is not to fear monger you and, you know, ruin your, ruin your potential winter holiday skiing vacation away from the sauna. You know, if you're otherwise healthy individual, you know, the act of relaxing is going to have benefits on you. And, uh, you know, these are, these are some risks associated with it, uh, that you can be mindful of, but if you're otherwise healthy, um, you know, doing it once in a while, I, you know, it seems realist, it seems reasonable, <laughs> but, uh, like I said, insufficient evidence to go recommending it for any medical condition. And there are potential risks. And in the, the subgroups that I mentioned, you really want to be extra wary of those risks, but, you know, like I said, I definitely, I definitely could see why you would enjoy doing it. <laughs> so on that note, who wants to invite me to their ski lodge? <laughs> Probably no one. Not only am I a buzzkill uh, at the beach, I'm also a buzzkill uh, on a winter vacation. <laughs> um, but anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed the Q&A today. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye.